I present you your speakers, Daniel Romero and Mario Rivas. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, everyone, and thank for coming to our talk, why you should fear the end of equipment, where we're going to present enterprise printer research. Okay. Thanks also to, to Descom for giving us this great opportunity. Okay, yes, first of all, just a brief introduction about who we are. This is Mario Rivas, and I'm Daniel Romero, and both work at, as security consultant and researchers at NCC Group in the Madrid office. Okay, here you have our Twitter account and emails, but if you want to know us better, we are always up for a beer, so just ping us. Okay, this is the agenda. This is a really classical agenda. First, an introduction about, uh, about our research and the tech surface that we have covered. Uh, the testing methodology, Mario will present the testing methodology and some facets that we have developed and a way across the different vulnerabilities that we have found. And after that, we will show you some exploit that we have developed. And just finally, a brief conclusions. Let's go with the introduction. Okay, um, the main goal of this research was testing enterprise devices, okay, and figure out the current state of security of them. For this reason, we thought that printed would be a good target, okay? Uh, we selected six different medium-sized enterprise printers, and we decided to focus this research in a great teaming approach, okay? So we did vulnerability research, exploitation, and post-exploitation. Keep in mind that it was not an assessment, so we only need one vulnerability that provides us remote code execution. We don't need to find all the vulnerabilities that the printer has, okay? And why printers? These are really good questions. Printers has been really uh, well extended say, many years ago around the, the, the companies. And they are usually connected to the different networks, different VLAN, so we can use them in order to uh, pivot in so the different department that company could have. Okay? And obviously information that could, could be managed by uh, a company is really sensitive. We have corporate information, personal, financial customers, and don't forget the information which was included or is included within the uh, configuration. We can have uh, domain accounts, credential, password, and etc. Okay, and well, usually uh, printers are considered low risk targets, so probably they are not included within the patch cycle, and uh, they probably they are not configured securely or properly. Okay, and then we have uncontrolled devices managing really sensitive information and connected to the most of the company's networks. This is an example of this week where Microsoft catches Russian state hackers using printers in order to, to attack companies, for example. And why not? Some vendors, some vendors decided to make statements like this one, so it is a challenge for us. <laughs> the most important, probably. <laughs> okay, let's go with the tax surface. Uh, first of all, just comment that we identified two different uh, operation systems within our printers, uh, the real-time operation system, RTOS, and Linux. And obviously, we identify many uh, different attack surfaces, like web applications and web servers, web services, sorry, mobile applications, file parsers, updates and firmware analysis, printed languages and services, external services, like the... Um, Google Cloud Print or AirPrint, management services, Telnet, NCNMP, and others, and proximity, proximity attacks like Wi Fi, USB, and free, and etc. And we also decided to include other two tasks post exploitation and hardware analysis. Okay? But obviously, we didn't have enough time to cover all these attack surfaces. And we finally decided to include the following ones. Those painted in gray because we didn't include them in all the print tests. Okay? Uh, this is a more detailed picture about our texture phase where you can see the different elements that we covered during this, in this research. And for example, for the printed languages and file formats, we decided to include the PGL, PGL, PCL, and the PSS language formats. Okay? Let's go with the testing and methodology. So this is the methodology that we mainly uh, use during the research. Uh, we started with the state of the art on uh, setting up our printers, and then we chose a uh, scope of our attack surface, as we just saw. And then, in a cycling process, uh, we started searching for vulnerabilities, uh, fasting different protocols, and finding some crashes. 
then analyzing them and then trying to exploit them in order to gain more knowledge about the device. Uh, all this while also analyzing the firmware in the cases we were able to obtain it and also uh, using the hardware to get some more useful information. Talking about fuzzing, uh, we started with dumb fuzzers, uh, which are very quick to launch but also, uh, well, and we continue de developing uh, smarter ones uh, which require more time but g give better results. Both techniques uh, gave us great results, but we also felt that we were spending more time than uh, we should. Uh, so we decided to create our own fuzzer. While looking at the state of the art, uh, we found two amazing tools, uh, Sally and Bufas. By the way, um, Joshua Pereira, uh, the maintainer of Bufas and Carl Pearson were here yesterday. Um, these two tools have great uh, modules and great uh, functionalities, uh, but we were changing a lot of the code, so we decided to, to fork Bufas and after Sally and Boo, uh, the next one was Wasowski, so we called this Wasowski. Uh, we wrote it in Python 3 and we changed, uh, improved some of the modules like the strang, uh, string fuzzing libraries and um, we also made fuzzer modules to keep oral protocol fuzzers under a single uh, program with a similar behavior. And between the rest of the changes, uh, we wanted to solve some difficulties that we were having. Different implementations of the same protocol behave uh, different in different targets and when a device crashes it can go totally down or maybe the, the service may stop answering or maybe it just print a stack trace in some debug interface. For this um, we made a main program with a lot of arguments to uh, avoid touching the code. Um, for different targets and we made monitor modules to constantly check the target. Then when the device crashed, um, a lot of times we will need to reboot it manually. So we made restarted modules um, to for example turn off and on a smart plug and adapt to any necessity we, we were having. And then uh, to give usability to the, to the fuzzer, we made a, a nice console where we can pause and control the fuzzing session and uh, do things like retest a uh, suspect packet, a uh, suspect case of crashing a device, and do other things like printing human readable format the packets that we are sending, and uh, we can also save standalone scripts uh, that we can, for example, uh, send to a manufacturer. So let's go with a very quick demo. Before that, uh, you can see here um, a typical Bufas uh, test case. Uh, printing and below um, the our console with the test case, the number of test cases, our target, and some more information about the actual test case. Let's go for the demo. That's it. Okay. Um, so we can see uh, below a pink to the uh, to the target, and we can see above um, the help with a lot of the comma the options that we have, uh, the different modules, the faster modules that we have uh, developed, the restarted modules, the monitor modules and other options. We are going now to launch uh, the faster to our target, the printer one in the port 631 using the internet printing protocol uh, faster and the get printer attributes command of the IPP protocol. And we are also using a restarted module that turns off and on and a smart plug when the device goes down. We can see here our cool logo and the console where with a lot of the commands that we implemented. We are going now to just test the connection sending a non fast packet to the printer. And after checking that the connection is okay, uh, we are going to go to a different test case and we are going to continue the execution from, from there. We can see here uh, the different test cases that we are sending, uh, like in very similar to Bufas. And after sending two of them, we will see below uh, that we will stop receiving ICMP messages. Uh, the printer has gone down, and now we cannot connect to the target, and we are going to use the restarter module to restart the target 
after that it will wait for it to recover and um it will continue the execution automatically. And but we don't want to do that, we can control C, go to the console uh, and we can for example print the suspects uh, where you can see the five on and one and we can also print this uh, test case in a human readable format. Uh, you can see all the decoded packet and the longest line uh, is you can see we are sending 10,000 C's instead of the default value which was EN. And we can also say, uh, see a proof of concept that we can copy and paste into a script and for example send it to a manufacturer or use it in an exploit. Then um after this uh, recovers we will retest it to see if it was this test case which was uh, causing the crash or it was any other reason. For that we can use the fast command and uh, we are going to launch the fast command for the 501 we will just test this test case and after that we stopped receiving ICMPs again. Uh, we have a bug in this case it was uh heat buffer flow and we can also save the uh, standard script into a file with the crash command and um disable this element to not test it anymore because we already know it's vulnerable and we don't want to spend more time with this. So that was the the main demo. Uh we we can find all the code after the talk in our external GitHub. And let's go for just a bit of hardware. We took a very good look at the hardware mainly searching for things that will help us with the exploitation of things. Like the back interfaces like uh serial ports, UART, uh, JTAG and other uh information that will allow us to dump the firmware or other useful information from the memory. And while doing that um we also were having too much fun uh, playing with the hardware uh, we did something that we shouldn't and uh, one of the printers will never print again because of that. Um we could say maybe kill a printer save a tree. I don't know. Um so one of the first things that we did was uh, looking for exposed memories like in this case where we used a uh, bus pirate which was connected to one of the chips and through the SPI protocol we downloaded the firmware from the from the from that memory. We also found uh, serial ports in three of the six printer uh, tested which uh, also we found uh, some JTAG ports that seemed to be disabled and uh, the serial ports were extremely useful as they gave us a lot of information, uh, debug information, uh, errors and the stack traces. And this was of course very useful to exploit some of the vulnerabilities that we found. Uh, also one of them had a interactive shell that allowed to write and read uh, memory and also execute from arbitrary positions. So we decided to make a hardware backdoor with this um which could be implanted with by someone with physical access to the printer in two or three minutes. For this we used a Raspberry Pi as you can see in the picture which was connected to the to the serial port and was also powered by it. So whenever the printer is on or Raspberry Pi will be on. And then this Raspberry Pi will connect to an, an access point and from there we could just uh, access to this console and have this these capabilities. That was a very quick look at the hardware and let's go for some of the most common flaws found in most of the printers. Um we started with the web applications and we found really weak default configuration exposing almost services available in the printers uh, more than 20 in some cases and we also found that it was giving access to the management panel with default or without credentials. Uh, we got the feeling that it was like the pro security of 20 years ago. Um, and of course we found a lot of the typical issues in our web like uh, cross request like forgery, uh, lack of access controls in some functionalities like um a one that allowed us to download a full uh, backup of the configuration including uh, passwords in clear text of course and uh, other things like cross-site scripting issues like one, two, three and four 
and a bit more interesting path traversal uh, which allowed us to to download some files but unfortunately uh, we were only able to download some specific extensions and we are not able to further exploit this to get closer to our objective which was uh, to get remote code ex execution. So all these issues are not bad but we are looking for something that may allow us to get uh, full control of the device. So looking at the firmwares we found a few slightly more interesting functionalities. Like this one you can see there a lot of information uh, a lot of debug information like authorization and security logs including session pa uh, cookies and also more information like active directory logs, uh, Kerberos virus logs, the full list of processes running in the machine and more information about the underlying operating system and Linux in this case. In this second case was very similar to the first one um with different functionalities under different URLs and this was uh, very useful to exploit one of the vulnerabilities that we will see later. And this third one was even better because it directly allowed us to download the full memory of the device containing any secret, uh, passwords, uh, anything in that at that moment. We also use this as a memory leak issue to defeat ASLR uh, when when exploiting one of the issues. We will see also that later. And of course all this was uh, accessible without any authentication because it's not even in the menus or anything so. So going for the memory corruption issues we found a lot of them in a lot of services not only in the web but also in um in other services like uh, printer protocols IPP or LPD or SNMP in the Google Cloud Print implementations basically a lot uh, more than we could handle or investigate so we really stopped searching for more. Um, we we had basically vulnerabilities everywhere which led to crashes everywhere and also some useful stack traces in some of the debug interfaces that we found like this one where you can see that the PC is overwritten and this is from a exploit that we won't uh, show you today but don't worry Dan is now going to to explain to others that are nice. Okay let's go with a couple of exploit examples sorry a couple of exploit examples that we 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 developed for this research. This is the first one, this is the easy case and it was found by one of uh, web application farces. Okay? As you can see in, in the image after sending a crafted HTTP request and we uh, with a long cookie value we were able to uh, crash the print. So probably this is a basic or stack bar flow. Okay? But looking into the framework we identified that uh, developers forgot to include boundary checks in the whole code. So probably this is track, uh, so this is string and copy here uh, which is copying the cookie value into a stack array could lead to a stack buffer flow. Okay. And uh, an important and also important point here is the count variable. The count variable is the is the cookie size including the cookie name, the equal symbol and the uh, cookie value. Okay. And it for it is for example used in some parts within the um, within the string copy uh, function like within the the size argument where, where uh, 15 bytes were subtracted from this from this variable. Okay. The question here mm, will be: Do you really think that there is only one bug here? The answer of this is no. Imagine that we replace the uh, equal symbol by a semicolon symbol. Okay. The com variable will result in 14. And 14 minus 15 is a negative number. So the the string and copy function will copy a really huge space in memory into the local array. So we have two different vulnerabilities in the same line. Here you have two proofs of concepts. The first one just send sending a really long cookie value, and the second one just replacing the equal symbol by a, by a semicolon symbol. Okay. And thinking about exploitation, uh, so looks looks like that we are going back to the 90s exploit, which is scarce. And let's go to check the different difficulties that we came across. The first one is uh, we identify ASLR within the stack and the heap. We didn't have um, software debug, and we are trying to exploit our real-time operation system. We, so we need to reverse engineer the firmware in order to identify some potential functionalities, for example, 
and use the, that functionalities in our shell code because we don't have a shell here, okay? Helpers, obviously, we have a direct PC overwritten, a potential read write, an executable in the whole space of memory, and we, we have the stack executable, okay? And finally, as Mario commented before, in the same printing, we identify a memory leak vulnerability that provide, that allow us to get the full memory. So, what what we what what we're going to do here is try to use this memory leak in order to bypass the ASLR. Okay, so the exploitation change should be we're going to send a shell code to the printer between patterns. Okay, we're going to use the memory leak vulnerability in order to dump the the memory. We're going to try to identify in that memory or shell code and where and try to look into. Um, into where our shell code was allocated, we're going to try to uh, trigger the buffer flow, and after that, jump into our shell code. Okay. Okay. Uh, but for our uh, red teaming tools, we want something more. And but so, what is the m one of the most important data managed by a printer? Obviously, the documents. And so, why don't create a shell code that is still all documents into the printer and send them through a reverse shell, which sounds like a good plan. Okay, let's go with the demo. For this demo, we are going to have two different machines. The first one is the attacker machine, which is going to execute the exploit, and the exploit handle that we will receive the, uh, the data from the printer. Okay, and the second machine is the victim machine that we are going to send the, the document to the printer. Okay, let me check the video. This is the Sorry, I'm moving. I can say it well. And uh, okay, here you have the demo. Sorry for this. Okay, uh, this is the the demo. Uh, here you have the. The attacker machine with uh, with an IP address, and below you can see the exploit. The exploit needs three different arguments. The first one is the target IP, the target port, and the reverse IP. We are going to include here the ta the, uh, the attacker machine IP address. So we are going to attack the printer one in the port 80, and after that the, we are going to include the printer machine. Before execute the exploit, we are going to execute our exploit handler that will will receive all uh, all data sent from the printer and the listening the pro in the port 1337. Okay, and after executing the exploit, as you can see in the uh, third line, we are, we are using the memory vulnerability in order to find uh, our payload in memory. Okay, so we have now received a connection from the printer with the sentence "had the planet friend" because it was included within the shell code. Okay, this is now the um, the attacker machine, the, sorry, the, the victim machine. Uh, with a different IP address, uh, what, what, what we are going to do now is sending this document to the printer. Okay, we are going to send this document to the printer one, which is this one. And after sending the document, you can see here, for example, how the exploit handler receives some data, data from the printer. Okay, so we are now converting this data to a PDF. And so, on. after two seconds. You can see here how we were able to uh, steal all data or documents and send to the printer, okay? And the printer continues printing normally, and our exploit handler also forward the all data sent to another printer controlled by the attacker. So we were able to steal all data or documents sent to our printer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's go with the second exploit. Uh, this was the easy case. And this is going to be the tricky case, uh, as we didn't have software and hardware debug, and all the protections and difficulties was implemented in this uh, this printer. So, it's not going to be easy to explain, uh, but we will try it. Okay, so be patient, please, because it's a bit tricky. Okay. We found uh, same vulnerability in the same place, but for this printer. But in this case, we have two different parts in the cookie value. Okay, the first part is uh, the first part is something like a hash, and the second part, separated by a, a comma, is something like a base 64 string. Okay. After reverse engineering the printer frameworks, 
we identify some potential that vulnerabilities that could contain this vulnerability. Okay, but the most important function was the function that decode the base 64 decode value. Okay. Uh, after analyzing this function, we identify how a struct was based as argument to this to this function to the base 64 decode function, and this has different elements included within the struct. The first uh, element is the source source pointer. Which is the base 64 string. The second is the destination pointer, which is the result of the base 64 string uh, that will uh, this will be filled mm, within this 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 function. And the source length and the destination length. Okay, but this function, the base 64 function, was called by the code in the highlighted area. As you can see here, we are calling the base 64 decode function, and we are passing a struct as argument okay and the buffer flow occurs because the destination pointer which is here was associated to a local array so if we send a really long cookie value base 64 encode we are over we are, um, the the basis for the code function will overflow the stack okay so this was Analyze locally, so we need to corroborate this dynamically. Okay, so we use the the Unicorn framework in order to emulate some some framework. If you don't know the Unicorn framework, uh, this framework allows you to emulate different parts of code. Let's see the the result, for example, the registers, and we decided to create a script that um, emulate the the function that get and check the second part of the cookie, the string length, the base 64 the code, and other functions. Okay, and after execute this the um, the script where we paste 100 uh, 100 as and base 64 as argument we were able to identify that the PC register the prone control register was overwritten by 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 ace okay we can also see how the stack pointer all, all data all data included with the stack pointer we can control all this data and uh, the R4 the R4 and R5 register were also overwritten by by ace okay this is because the last instruction instruction execute before before triggered all of this is a pop instruction which is popping the R4 uh, R4 R5 and um, the pop the PC register okay so we have now all the information that we need in order to create our shell code but everything becomes inside here we identified that the stack was not ex executable. We also identified that we tried to, to, to use many finger addresses in order to create a shell code or a drop change, but none of them worked properly. Okay? And we also identified that this, uh, the, the printer was using a, a modified T kernel RTOS. But the most important point here is that this is a non -mono monolithic operation system and different tasks could be executed at the same time. So probably what the kernel is doing here is take uh, a code from the firmware and execute this code in memory in a different address. Okay? So this is the reason because we were not able to use uh, firmware addresses to create or, re or shell code or drop change. So therefore, we didn't know where and how original code can be executed. We have something like SLR or, or NOPSETs. Uh, we have uh, NX. Uh, we didn't were, uh, we were not able to identify valid addresses to create all drop chains. Uh, but we need, we need to identify valid addresses in order to do that. Okay? So thinking about it, we thought about different approaches that we can use, for example, reverse engineering the T kernel structure. But obviously, we didn't have enough time to do this because it could take weeks. Uh, reverse engineer the bull ladder in order to identify potential static addresses, identify static memory, but we don't know what permit, like configuration, for example, but we don't know what permission could be associated to that piece of code or memory, sorry. But for random addresses that we'll see now on looking for helpers, okay? Helpers like this one. This is an infinite loop that we found within the, the ball ladder. So and we thought that it could be a good option use this infinite loop in order to create a blind exploitation. Okay? Imagine that we have a code that we don't know if it was executed or executed or not properly. What we can do now is just after the, that code, we're going to try to jump to our infinite loop. Okay? If the printer remains up, that means that the code was executed properly. If the printer crashes, that means that the code was not executed properly. So it's something like a blind injection, but with memory corruptions. Okay? 
Um, okay, uh, we decided to mix the the infinite loop call helper with uh, the following approach of brute force in the PC register with potential firmware addresses and figure out what instruction were executed. Let me explain, okay? Uh, the main goal here is uh, we're going to helping us with the code, with the infinite loop uh, code helper. We're going to try to brute force in the PC register, okay? And we're going to, to, to try to guess or identify what instruction was executed in, more, in memory, blindly, okay? So remember that we can control the PC register on all data included within the stack pointer. Okay. Imagine that we we forcing the PC register, we finally jump into a pop instruction, but we don't know that this is a prop instruction. Okay. And we're going to include some data within our step pocketing, like three set of A's, and after that the infinite loop address. If we execute this code, the PC re the R0 register will be overwritten by the first set of A's, okay? Be uh, and the second, um, the, the PC register will, will be overwritten by the second first of phase, so set, second set of A's, sorry. And so the printer will be down, the printer will crash, okay? But in order to solve this and try to guess what extraction was executed in moment, we can change the formation including, included within the stack pointer. This is a, another example, uh, but th for this case, we're going to just include one set of A's within the stack pointer, and after that, the infinite loop address. If we execute the same code, the same address, after they execute this address, the R0 register will be overwritten by the first set of A's, and the PC register will be overwritten by the second, oh, sorry, by the second address, which is the infinite loop. So the printer will remain up. So Using this methodology, we were able to identify that in memory, uh, we are executing in memory a pop register, okay? Which is popping a one register, and after that, the, in the program counter. So using this methodology uh, or approach, we were able to identify three instructions in memory. The first one in the address 12, which was an add instruction. The second is uh, in the other two, uh, 14, sorry, uh, which was a, a pop instruction, and in a distance of 500 bytes, we were able to identify another pop instruction, okay? So our main goal here is to identify the same pattern that we have found in memory in all firmware, okay? And we finally were able to identify this pattern, but in another address. That means that the, when the kernel is executing this code, the kernel is applying an offset to to this to this code, and we now know the address that, that exactly offset that the kernel is using. Okay, this provides us useful gadgets in order to create our shell, our shell code and potential helpers to continue with the task execution. Sorry for that, but this is the way that we found in order to create our exploit. Okay, but it was not enough. We need more gadgets in order to create our exploit. And at this, this moment, we remember that as Mario commented before, we remember that another function, another vulnerability which allow us, would provide us some useful, useful information was found in the same printer. This um, memory leak or, or information leak vulnerability provides where exactly uh, images and GIF were allocated in memory. So we can use this information in order to bypass the ASLR protection, for example. And why not? We can also use this information in order to create a ROP change, okay? Or we're going to do something like exploitation with images, okay? So we're going to download all the images and GIF to our laptop and we're going to use the ROP gadget script in order to find some interesting ROP gadgets, okay? Obviously, this is not current code, coherent code because they are images, but we were able to identify some useful, useful drop gadgets to create all full exploit, okay? But we came across with another problem. This was the last problem, I promised you. <laughs> um, we identify, uh, we came across with caches, okay? So we need to flush the caches. There are some options here, like call, RM instructions or different um, functions like sleep, main protection, and others, or continue with the execution flow, which is probably the most harder, the harder but the most professional option. And we choose this option. Just quickly, 
Um, in order to continue with execution flow, we need that our shell code implement three different um, parts. The first one is our exploit. For example, we can use, uh, we can create something like for the previous uh, exploit where we are going to hook the print functionality and steal all data through a reverse connection. The second part uh, should change the address that we were able, uh, we were able to overwrite with the with the vulnerability in order to jump in a valid function. And then we we want to continue with the execution. So we need a valid function that we can read he here. Okay. And the third uh, the third part that um, we should align the stack pointer again to a previous pointer because we have, for example, execute or payload or change some addresses. So we need to align this stack pointer to a previous state. Okay. And after that, just trigger the vulnerability as many times as you want. Okay. Let's go with the demo. Uh, for the previous um, exploit, we try to attack the documents of, of a printer, but for this demo, we are going to, attack, to try to attack all the information included within the within a printer data. Uh, let me check the demo. Okay, for for this demo, we implemented three different functionalities within the within our our exploit. The first one is uh, write, so we can write bytes into the into the printer memory, and after that, jump into that to that memory. For example, we can write uh, a, se a shell code, and after that, jump into our shell code. The second is similar to the previous one, but we can write a file that we have in our computer, for example, in a, a piece of code. And the last one is the read functionality. This allows us to read some data from the printer memory, but we need a way in order to allocate the memory or copy the memory, okay? So what we did here is we are going to try to copy the memory that we want to read in a known place. We know where exactly images and GIF were allocated, so we are going to use this piece of memory in order to read the information, okay? Uh, well, you need the source address, and after that, the, um, the, the size, and here you have the, uh, the image that we are going to use in order to, to exploit this, this function. Uh, here you, have seen, you can see how it is a normal PNG header, okay? So we are going to use the read functionality to read this address, we're reading 500 bytes, and you can see here, for example, how we are reading the information, the address that we have set, and writing this information in another, in another address, which is the image. Okay, and after that, we're going to download again the the image. As you can see here, the information the included within the image changes, and it is now a. Uh, uh, certificate included within the our printer memory. Okay, so with this function, we were able to read credentials, domain accounts, uh, uh, and other uh, sensitive information. Okay, so let's go with the second, uh, the first functionality, which is the write. We can write a shellcode, for example, but for this demo, we are going to just write uh, a sentence, so the high one sentence. We are not to jump to this this code because it's a it's a, it's a sentence, and after we write this information, if we download again the image, we can see, for example, how the hybrid one sentence was uh, was right in the first um, in the first line of the image. Okay, and let's go with the uh, the uh, the, th the third example, which is the write file. So what we are going to do here is we are going to try to overwrite an existing web portal image. Okay. Uh, so we're going to select uh, a, a, a logo that we have in memory. Are going, we are going to try to overwrite an existing image in the in the memory. It can take a bit. So we are selected a logo, a logo and we are writing the, the information within the logo in a known address. Let's go to move this forward because it takes a bit. And after two seconds. We are going to open the 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 web portal image, which is this one that we are going to we are going to overwrite. And if we refresh again this image, we can see how the NC group logo overwrite the image that we have in memory. So we so we can control all the information that we have in the printer memory in order to read this or, or to write this uh, into into our printer. Okay. Let's go with the last part, the conclusions. Okay, I hope you are all still alive after Danny trying to explain this last exploit. Um, 
Let's go with the responsible vulnerability disclosure. Uh, we started this process in February and we got a very mixed response from the vendors. Some of them had a very mature procedure for this and were really quick fixing the issues and uh, publishing patches. Special mention to Lexmark, which response was great. And on the other hand, some others we could just say that uh, it was easier to find the vulnerabilities than their security department. So uh, there is some work to do in that area. Um, we already published all the security advisories, um, most of them two days ago. And as a quick overview, as you just saw, uh, we found a lot of issues in a lot of places which uh, lead uh, in most cases to remote code, uh, code execution issues. And let's go for the CVE party. Uh, we found, uh, fi uh, well, we got 50 uh, CVs. Um, most of them high and critical risk ones, and just don't take the number per manufacturer as an indicative of their state of security because some of them grouped different vulnerabilities under the same entries. Um, just for a quick reference, the full list. And going for the main conclusions, um, this research aimed to show how the state of security of common office devices uh, such as printers which are present in most if not all organizations is uh, still very mature and largely ignored. We found a large number of critical and high risk issues in all the printers tested. Uh, we got uh, proof of concept for four of them. We show he, uh, we shopped here two of them. One for documents and one for other data within the printer. And we ran out of time to um, to show uh, to develop uh, the exploits for the two others. So, but anyway, there were issues that cooled it uh, easily to that. Uh, a lot of CVs, and we stopped searching for vulnerabilities. So this was important. We think there is a lot more of issues uh, waiting in there. And we only checked a few services. Uh, there is a lot uh, more things to research here. And by what we saw, uh, the first one looking at this will probably find gold in there. And we only check six printers, but we do not expect the same manufacturers having different implementations for some of the protocol sites, such as IPP or different web applications, etc. So probably the number of num uh, devices affected by these issues is huge. Um, much bigger than the number gave by some of the manufacturers. We could also say to some vendors that less marketing and more security. Um, and the main recommendations for, for manufacturers will be to simply invest in security. It's necessary in all the development uh, phases of a product. Uh, for organizations, they should start considering this as the threats they are. Um, they have a lot of sensitive information, uh, not only documents but also uh, important in, uh, information in the configuration like passwords, domain credentials, etc. And they are connected to their corporate networks. So they are really high risk and no low risk uh, devices. And finally for hackers, uh, this is a very mature field. If you spend some time with embedded devices uh, starting from the with the very basics, uh, you will probably find a lot of issues, uh, you will learn a lot, and there is a lot of fun in here, so you should give it a try. And about internet, uh, as expected, uh, a quick shot and search revealed a lot of these devices connected to the internet. And we even saw that um, some different vendors uh, seem to be using the same code for some things like this web application of two different ones which as you can see is quite similar so m maybe we tested more vendors that than we thought. And finally acknowledgements uh thanks uh, to the Madrid office to Matt Lewis and Philip Moss for all their help and support. Also thanks to Maribel and Chris which suffered us the most. And last but not least thank you to Alvaro Felipe uh, who was part of the research during the first days and also helped us with great ideas uh, during the, the exploitation phases. 
So it was very difficult to put this talk in these months of research in just 45 minutes, but uh, thank you for suffering us. That's it. <laughs>